This afternoon, we're going to carry on with the theme of development. And our next speaker, um, I've been catching up with him behind the scenes and, and speaking to people that know him, is not going to disappoint. He's going gonna, gonna to really throw some interesting ideas out there for you to take into account. Um, Tommy Niemela is the current head coach for Lati Pelicans in the Finnish Elite Liga. Tommy has traveled the world through his hockey passion and work, and he has a really strong passion for continuous learning and for racket sports. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And um, between 2009 and 2015, he served for six seasons in the Pelicans organization as head coach in some of the age groups. He's also been a head coach for junior Finnish national teams at the under-16, under-17, under-18, and under-20 level, including winning the World Championship in 2018. And he says that his favorite sentence is, are the players there for the coach, or is the coach there for the players? So let's find out what he has to say. Please welcome Tommy Niemela. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. And first of all, of course, good afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure and, of course, a big honor always to be presenting in these kind of events where you see people who, who really enjoy coaching and want to get, get better in it and also learn more. And hopefully I can, I can present you one way of doing things also maybe differently and not like they have been always done. Um, at the moment, of myself, a few words. I have to tell a 38-year-old, very young coach still, uh, originally from Helsinki, Finland, born there, Engage, no kids, and, and like, like Sergio said, my, my passions in, in life are around uh, good red wine and then racket sports. And padel is now, of course, a big thing now in, in, in Europe, and I have, I have gotten into it and played way too much at the moment. So hopefully I have time also to still focus on, on coaching, but, but it, is, it is a big joy to play different kind of uh, sports. I was a goalie myself, if there's any goalies over here. You guys are the best. They are usually the most brightest ones in teams. And, and, and we usually also have our luck in all kinds of events in life. But, but, but I think that's, that's also a big part of, of personality and uh, very mediocre goalie. I, I played well professionally and semi-professionally until I was 24, then uh, got injured. Unfortunately, had to stop playing, but then actually a new chapter in life started and this journey as a, as a starting coach came into life and then uh, I'm, a, I'm a product of, of Vierumäki. I have studied there for many years and, and I'm very grateful for those persons who have given me the opportunity to, to develop myself in the way they have, they have taught it and they have taught me and also actually many others to develop yourself. There's no bound, there's no roof anymore there when you're ready to develop yourself. And thank you for those persons who are also over here today, who have been my who have been my teachers, and and uh, I'm forever grateful for them over that. My biggest question, what I want to today uh, ask you guys is: Is are the players there for the coach, or is the coach there for the players? I am at the moment working, working uh, on a professional level in, in Lahti Pelicans. I'm starting now my third year as a head coach over there. And, and Okay, I'm not a coach yet because I have not been fired yet. It's going to happen. I know it for, for sure. We have now another symposium over there where all the head coaches of the, of the Finnish Liga are here and also the GMs. And I know that they're going to fire me at some point. But I'm still on the way to becoming a coach because I have not yet... They, they have not yet fired me, but it has been an uh, interesting journey also to see that professional side. I was two years in, in Switzerland, in Lausanne as an assistant coach before I came over here to Finland. And everybody was saying always that, yeah, on the, on the pro level, you can't talk about development. You can't talk about getting better. You just have to make results. And I think that's bullshit. Like, that's my, my view. I think in life, we should always talk about development and getting better. And hopefully I can bring this kind of insight also to you guys today. Uh, first, the video. In most companies, um, if you're new and you ask, you know, why is it done this way? The answer is because that's the way we do it here or because that's the way it's always been done. And in my opinion, the largest contribution of much of this quality thinking is to approach these ways of doing things, these processes, at, at scientifically, 
where there is a theory behind why we do them. There is a description of what we do, and most importantly, there is an opportunity to always question what we do. And this is a radically different approach to business processes than the traditional one, because it's always done this way. And that single shift is everything, in my opinion, because it, it, in that shift is a tremendous optimistic point of view about the people that work in a company. It says these people are very smart. They're not, they're not pawns. They're very smart. And if given the opportunity to change and improve, they will. They will improve the processes if there's, if there's a mechanism for it. And um, that, that optimistic humanism uh, I find very appealing. And I think we have countless examples uh, that it works. Okay, young Mr. Jobs here, of course, he built some kind of company. Probably you have also some of their products, maybe a phone, maybe an iPad or something. And, and he brings in that insight that if we want to do something uh, with a different end result, it's, it's crazy to do things like they have always been done. We want to be able to get better, so we have to try also some other ways. And, and, and this is the big picture that I want to draw today. The first background idea of what we do at the moment in Lahti is an idea of Kaizen. It was Dr. Stephen Norris who taught up actually me about it 15 years ago almost in Vieromäki. I heard it the first time, just about continuous improvement. We have to have a background idea. Then, of course, we have to have fuel somehow, how we do it, how we can, how we can implement that background idea, and that's intrinsic motivation today, what I'm going to talk about there. Then we have to have, of course, that daily work, how we do our daily work with our guys, with our players, with our athletes. And then, because we are in a team sport, we have to have a way how to do it together. So these four topics I want to go briefly through. And if you guys have at any moment any criticism, any questions or whatever, just raise your voice. We have a voice and, and I, I, I can't hear that well. But if you talk loud, I can hear and then I can also answer your questions. But these four things... These are the, this, this is the picture that what we do and what we believe in. And this journey, I hope, can at least somehow raise questions in your own head that can we do things differently than they have been always been do, uh, done before. Let's start with Kaizen, of course. Like Dr. Stephen Norris used sandcastles. I think this is a very good way of showing it. Continuous improvement. You go on to the beach. And, and you build a sandcastle, you go on on that beach, there's always somebody who builds a better sandcastle. And then again, there's always somebody who builds a better sandcastle. It's a question of top-level sports. If you want to be the best, you always have to get better. Always. Because somebody else is trying to catch up. And of course, in whole life also. like If we want to live our lives until we're, let's say, hopefully 95, it's pretty boring if you don't develop, if you don't get better or if you don't learn anything new. So this as a background idea is a big one. Another thing who a very bright-minded person in Finland actually taught was Susanna Rahkamo. Uh, she's an ice dancer or former ice dancer and, and, and a doctor these days. Her doctoral thesis was about good versus top. The opposite of top is not bad. The opposite of top is good. It's pretty easy to, to do good stuff, to practice well, to play well. Good teams react to situations differently than top teams. Top is not that easy anymore. If you want to succeed in top-level sports, you have to do top choices every day. Good choices are not good enough, not top enough. And, and these two big things, continuous improvement and top versus good, that's everything in a way for, for our program, what we're leading at the moment. That's everything in all situations. And it's pretty easy then to build the plans and to do that daily work when, when these are in your head all the time. But of course, you need that fuel, you need that energy in order to implement this every day. It's a journey that matters, not one result of one game or one season. This is Hannes Björninen. Uh, I have permission to use his pictures. He knows that we're using it here. He's a player at the moment in the Finnish national team, plays fourth line centerman. And then I got the honor to 
walk his athlete journey together for six years in juniors and, and now again on the pro level also for one and a half years and really great person who believes also in a journey and not results. He wants to get better every day. And this is actually just this, what, what has happened. There he's a, he's a, oh you, <laughs> he's a young boy here, 14 year old. Then first time in, in the men's team, then captain of the men's team and now Olympic gold medalist. Hopefully, hopefully, I'm sorry, hopefully also world champion in, in, in one week, but that's just what we're wishing for. But again, a result in a season, a result in a game should never be the reason why, why we practice differently the next day. We always want to get better just. The results, they just keep coming and they will come every time. Either you lose or you win. And again, the next day you have to be there to develop. We should not be too much focused on those results. And if you start thinking that this is the background for everything, we get into the fuel. Motivation. We talk about motivation, why we do stuff. There's intrinsic motivation and there's extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic comes from outside. You get money, prices. Maybe somebody wants to say to you from the outside that, man, you're good or man, you're bad. And then there's intrinsic motivation, which comes from inside. And this intrinsic motivation, this is a thing that has been studied a lot. Probably the most studied is the self-efficacy, uh, self-determination theory by Mr. Desi and Mr. Ryan. All human beings need three things to feel good in their life, to feel top in their life, to be happy. You have to have autonomy, you have to have a feeling that you're competent in something, and you have to have a feeling that you belong to something bigger. If these three things happen in your life, you have motivation to get better. And this is our coaching. We try every day to pick on these three feelings with our players. The feeling of autonomy, the feeling of competence, and the feeling of relatedness. If we are able to do that, if we can increase their intrinsic motivation, they will do all the work they, that has to be done. We don't have to motivate them anymore. They are motivated to make themselves better every day. And I think this is what makes it so easy then also. All our actions are somehow planned to increase these ones. Okay, in, in ice hockey, it's a team sport. Feeling of autonomy, we start with that one. This is a washing machine. If I press the button, it washes my clothes in one hour. If I want that, that my, my clothes are washed faster, I put on a speed program. And if I don't like how it's done, I can shout to the washing machine, but it's still going to do the work in that exact amount of time that we want. Unfortunately, humans don't work like that. Unfortunately, that is, a player is already some kind of expert in what he's doing. If he's not skating fast enough, we shout usually a skate faster. <laughs> he skates as fast already as he can. He's motivated to do it because he plays. We have to find another way how to do it. This is two Finnish guys, Valtteri Filppula at the moment, the captain of, of, of the Finnish national team. Very self-driven, very self... Uh, his self-knowledge is, is on a really high level. I've known him for a long time, um, and, and it has been interesting to see what kind of career he has done for himself. If I would tell him that you have to skate faster, he gets annoyed. He gets annoyed. So I have never met that goal that I have to be able to meet every day with the, with the person. So that's the trust, of course, what the coach needs with his player. But they will do, they are motivated already to skate fast. So I have to find a way somehow, in, a, in another way, how to, how to strengthen his feeling of autonomy. In our case, we talk about that they have to be active members in their development process. We have to find ways how to get them to feel that they own their process. In our case, we talk about timetables, schedules. We don't, have, we, we don't start every day together at 9 a.m. 
we have a meeting, then we go off ice, then on the ice, then we have a meeting again. No, we have many days that they can decide themselves when they come to the rink, when they do their off ice practice. The team practices at, at, at a certain time. Unfortunately, we have to use that one. It's a team sport. But we have to get them to feel that they own their own process. And then that feeling of autonomy gets stronger. Feeling of competence. Alexander Barkov. Uh, his father, very interesting person, older gentleman, uh, Alexander Barkov's senior. He said about his son that he's very shy outside the ice and on the ice he doesn't know anybody else who's so courageous. He knows that when he goes on the ice that he is better than everybody else. But when he comes off the ice, very shy, doesn't look in the ice, he's a big man. <laughs> he, he, could, he could dominate everybody also off the ice. But and he's shy there. But this is the thing that we have to be able also to build, that feeling of competence. We have to be able to show the athletes that they have developed some kind of way of measuring things. It can be, of course, it's easy. To, like physical testing is easy. Numbers are easy. But the biggest thing would be that we teach our athletes subjectively how to measure themselves. Self-evaluations. And we have to teach it. It's a skill. Usually, adults are able somehow critically to, to evaluate their own actions. Somehow. Some are better, some are worse. But if we don't start that process at some point, it will never get better. So we have to be able to find ways also how to show our athletes that you have gotten better. As a player, as an athlete, maybe even as a human being. That would be great. The third one, feeling of relatedness. In a team sport, it's pretty easy to touch this area. We have been playing team sports for a long time. We know we, we belong to a team. We want to win together. We want to feel those, those moments together, those, th that energy of winning and losing together. But if we want to really win something big, if we want to achieve something big, we have to have a good team spirit and atmosphere in that surrounding where we live in. Okay, in this case, we talk about the rink. We have our locker rooms. We have the gym. We have the ice. There has to be an open atmosphere where everybody can be what they are. We have to give that possibility to everybody. It's pretty hard these days. It, we talk about a professional team, but we have 17 players in our team who are born 2,000 or younger. They're still kids. They have all kinds of happenings in their life. We have a 2002 boy, a uh, born player in our team, uh, NHL drafted, and uh, he doesn't get a lot of money for playing, but he's a professional player. All of his money goes into uh, sweatpants, hats, which cost 1,500 euros. And I ask him, okay, those sweatpants, what you have now on, how much did you pay for those ones? 1,800 euros. I said, well, I can give you those ones for free. I have at home those kind of same ones. But it says just one brand over there. It's crazy. And still, we have, to, we have to understand why they are like that. And we have to give them that, that possibility to be who they are. So that they feel safe. They feel that they belong here. And if we are able to do this, autonomy, competence, and relatedness, they are happy and they are motivated to make them better, themselves better. So this is the fuel, this is the energy that we have to have. Then the coach doesn't have to motivate anybody. They are motivated to make themselves better every day. So if we think of this background, then we come to that daily work. We are, as a coaching staff, committed to be there for the players. They play, they perform, they practice. They are the ones who should be in the spotlight. It's their dream. We, have to help. we are there to help them to achieve their dreams. What it means for us, we are not puppet masters. We are not the ones who are putting the chess pawns to one place. We are on the same level with the guys. We try to be on the same level. Of course, there's still 
usually the head coach who has to give some kind of direction for the team where to go. But our players have to have the feeling that those coaches are on my side. They are on my side. They are not against me. And this was interesting, actually. We have a couple of guys from Switzerland also here. And, and I was two years in, in, in Lausanne. And when we talked to the players, it, it took a long time for them to believe that we are on their side. But when they believed, then open as hell for everything. Ready to do whatever it takes to get better. But this should be the way. The, the, the coaches should be there for the players. This is just my firm belief and I hope that somehow we would get away from that Napoleon syndrome what we as coaches have, that, that we would be the ones who decide everything. It would be great at some point to get the players to decide for almost everything. Almost everything. Not everything, but almost everything. But a big thing. This is, this is like that, that kind of scheme about what we do. We have the team process on the, on the right side for one season. There's, of course, five-on-fives, there's special teams, there's uh, face-offs, there's everything what there has to be. There's group dynamics for the team. And then on the left side is one individual player's development plan for one season. And the player is responsible for that one. And this is how it looks like then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Too much. This is how it looks like that we as coaches, I can press the right button. We lead this team process and we are secretaries for these 36 development process of individuals for that one season. There's the tactical side, the technical side, the skills side, the physical side, there's everything in that one. But we have to be able to help them lead their own process. And I think this is somehow even a good picture for that one to, to show it that this is how it goes. We lead the team process and then we are secretaries in that individual development process. We, we support them there. And this is what our season is. We believe in meeting the person. This is our meeting the person on, on, on an individual level. This is that individual side. Defenders, we have individual ice sessions. Our skills coach runs them where you meet the person. You are there for him. We have individual meetings which take 35 to, to 50 minutes four or five times per year. We have individual video feedback, of course, of the game. We have this kind of core care process during the season. And, and this gives a, an amount of meetings. Our defenders, we had last year, of course, we have also a, a good staff for this one. This is not for one just, but for our whole staff. Our forwards 915 times. And then we have goalies who are with the goalie coach 321 times. And these are all structured meetings so and I'm, I'm, I don't mean by meetings that we are sitting together with a, with a computer but so that okay now we are here together and we talk about development about the game about getting better in this great sport of hockey and I think th that number is pretty good I have to say that we have a possibility to really help these individuals to get better with those numbers and if we do this if we can get close to them, if we can get them to trust us, I think that our club, our team, is going to win. At some point, the result will just be good enough to hoist a trophy, because we all want to win still. I'm a very competitive person. <laughs> I want to be the best in what I do, but we want to be the best as a team in our league at the moment also. We are not yet there, so because we were talking about serial winning coaches. No, not yet there. <laughs> not, not yet there. And, and we believe that we are consensus and, and we believe that we are doing the work, but not yet. Maybe at some point, hopefully. Hopefully at some point. These are the coaching processes that we lead. We have 36 development processes last year. We have the team process where, like, like I said, five on five, face offs, PK, PP, everything what is there. And then there's the staff process also. As a head coach, you are responsible for the staff. We often forget about that one, that, that it, 
continuous development has to happen also inside that staff. We have six coaches, we have two uh, uh, material guys, and then, then we have a physiotherapist and a masseuse. So we have to be certain that they also develop, or at least that they have a chance to develop. We have to be able to build that kind of surrounding for them, and also demand development in that one also. This is our team actions, what we did last year. This is from last year. We had 100, 128 ice practices, that's not a lot. But unfortunately, during COVID, it has been interesting, actually, two seasons being, being a head coach in the Finnish league where you have no idea when you're going to play games because of COVID. They're going to be changed everywhere and, and, and it takes away time to practice. But 128 out of those, were I think 49 were game day morning skates, which is... Yeah, that's not a practice even. So it's not that much that you have time to be with your team. That's why we have to be able to make our individuals really develop. Video meetings, yeah, group dynamics. I like, I, I read, I, I've read a lot of books and in, in Alex Ferguson's book, he said that he invited the opponent's coaches after the game to have a glass of red wine because he wanted to show them that he respects their work. Nobody else respects coaches as much as coaches because they know what they do. So we started this last year, and, and I'm, I'm really proud of this one. This is, this is our, we started this one. That after the game, when, when somebody comes to Lahti and plays a game, we give uh, 10 beers to the opponent's staff. We win or we lose. We appreciate their work. We, we really appreciate what they're doing. So a couple of teams jumped into this one, and they started to do the same thing, and of course, you want to do better than the other one. So we went over there and they gave a little bit more and then we had to give more and, and then they gave more and it was not any more beers, it was also wine and some adult toys also and all kinds of stuff. So it, it, it was interesting, it was really interesting this kind of thing and the appreciation between persons who are doing this job has to get bigger in the whole world. So I think this was a nice gesture, a nice way of, of showing them that we appreciate them. But this is our team, actually. Yeah, sorry. Short video. The Navy SEALs are one of the highest performing organizations on the planet. And a former Navy SEAL was asked, who makes it through BUDS? Who makes it through the selection process to become a SEAL? And he said, I can't tell you who gets through, who makes it, but I can tell you the kind of people who don't make it. He said the star college athletes that never have been really tested to the core of their being, none of them make it through. He said the preening leaders who like to delegate everything, none of them make it through. He said the big tough guys that come in with huge muscles covered in tattoos who want to prove to everyone how tough they are, none of them make it through. He said some of the guys that make it through are skinny and scrawny. He said some of the guys who make it through, you will see them shivering out of fear. He said, but every single one of them who makes it through, when they're emotionally exhausted, when they're physically exhausted, some way, somehow, they're able to dig down deep inside themselves to find the energy to help the person next to them. Service, service, giving to another, having their back is what makes the highest performing teams in the world, not their strength and not their intelligence. It's their willingness to be there for each other. Simo Sinek, a pretty bright-minded person if you want to look into his books or, or TED Talks or whatever, but he says exactly what it is. And I come to the last part of, of, of this presentation that we have to have some kind of idea of how to be together. And, and for us, it has been the model of tribal leadership. Interesting, interesting thing, like I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an Indian or nothing else, but, but I, I stumbled into this one by reading Phil Jackson's books, pretty successful basketball coach and he was talking about tribal leadership and then he started winning when he started using this philosophy with his his teams with Michael Jordan with Jack O'Neill with Kobe Bryant and then I think 10 championships as a coach and one as a player somehow he can say also that why it works but interesting thing I'm not going to preach about this one but I have to say that somehow I believe into it because I also have seen how it works. I have felt that thing and, and it's, it's interesting. And these days, actually, when I go to a couple of, when, when I go to, to some, some company or, or some work environment, you can easily start seeing people that on what stage they are in. 
it consists of five stages which talk about uh, language and how people relate to each other, what their relationships are inside the work community. And uh, these stages, they combine culture. And culture, in a, in a really good book, Culture Code, comes from the Latin word cultus, which means caring. It's a pretty great word, actually, caring, that you care about each other. And, and uh, in this five stages cultural map of, of tribal leadership, is shown that the two lowest ones, life sucks, my life sucks, are not that successful. The third one, where I'm the best and you are not, where you compete yourself against anybody, like you want to be the best inside your own working community, sometimes actually are successful. I would say that former President Mr. Trump, pretty successful, he was the President of the United States. It's a pretty big thing. And I think he's a good example of that I'm great and you are not, that he, he is the best one. But then if we want to succeed continuously, winning year after year, or at least compete to win year after year, that we are somewhere there, we have to get into, into that fourth stage. We are the best and you are not. That we want as a group really to compete against another group. And we are not talking anymore about me or myself. And this was interesting in the junior national team. I know we were not together all the time and, and the players developed. Two years, I think Ma Martin, Martin was, his son was playing against us in the 2000 boards. Pretty good player, Rasmus Dalin, have to say that one. We lost all games in the under 16s and the under 17s. And under 18 year in November, we as a staff, changed everything in our, our way of doing and we started talking about we's only and, and our, our language changed and suddenly we started winning and then we actually did not lose anymore to anybody. We won against everybody else. It was interesting to see that change. Okay, the fifth, day, fifth stage is life is great that you don't compete any, against anybody anymore. You want to do only good for the whole world, which is a mindset that I don't know yet how, how that one goes. I still want to compete. I want to compete against all. Oh, it's, it's a great feeling to compete. But every individual in, in a work, work environment are jumping up and down in these, these uh, different stages. And, and, and we really have to work towards getting everybody into at least that fourth stage that we talk only about we's. There's, there's no me anymore. Only we. We have meetings only with the, the minimum amount of meetings is, is three persons, at least in that kind of structural meeting. When I talk that we have individual meetings with players, we have often three persons in that one. We are having meetings also with two or three players. That, is, that, that knowledge gets, gets much better uh, around our work environment if we have bigger meetings than just two persons. Of course, sometimes we have to be together just we talk about very individual and personal stuff so then then often that trust has to be built first between two persons but it's a part of this one that triads is the smallest um, way of having a meeting it was mr paul carson from hockey canada who said and in one uh, in one lecture that I was listening that the difference where you are in five years is, is by the people you meet and the books you read. This was his, his sentence. It's a, it's a good sentence. Uh, as a student, I started reading a lot and this is just a couple of really good books. I'm a passionate fan of German football. Die Mannschaft. Passionate fan. And, uh, oh, again, wrong. Wrong. This one. This book is, a, is an interesting das reboot where they talk how they changed their whole system in the, in the country because the national team was not winning in the beginning of the 90s and then they started to win again. Interesting book of changing a, a like nationwide system. Very good book by Angela Duckworth, it's grit. There's actually a small chapter of Finnish Sisu in that one also, which I don't know how to, how to tell you what it is, but it's a part of grit somehow. Very good book of how you have to relentlessly pursue something to achieve something bigger. If you have a possibility to read Aki Hintza's book in English, Voittamisen uh, Anatomia means Anatomy of Winning, 
really good self-coaching book of how to live your life. And of course, like maybe the, the base of, of my beliefs is talent is overrated and, and culture code, which, which tells that talent is actually practice talent. That's the, everything, like how hard you work to get better day after day after day. That's the base of into what I believe. I don't believe in being born into something because if it would be that one, then I'm 100% sure that I'm not going to win anything anymore at any point. So hopefully it has something to do with working and really working hard also to get there. But really good books, and I strongly suggest you guys to read a lot. And now in the end, still, uh, I think in life the most important thing is laughter and smile. So in the end I want to stop with a good video actually also which somebody else had just to remind you which is the most important thing in life. Thank you very much for your time that you listened and hopefully you got something out of this one. Thanks, Tommy. Um, and thank you for that video. I think I'm going to steal that video. Yeah, and, I, st and I also it. stole it. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, look, you, you mentioned that the highest stage was um, innocent wonderment. And I think throughout your presentation, you put everybody here on that stage for, for the duration of your, of your session. So thank you very then much. Then they're higher than me. Then they're, <laughs> I think it's good then. Way higher. Uh, I've got uh, an observation first and then a question. And then we'll open the floor for everybody. Um, yesterday, when I was presenting about the serial winners, uh, we finished by saying that really one of the things that they all did was find ways to, uh, to switch off and to regenerate. And we talked about they all found their own version of Homer Simpson. And it seems like you found that. You talked about your red wine and your paddle and your racket sports. How important is that for you to be able to, to switch off from what you do? Very important, then. and I, I have to say, personally, without being able to, to sweat and play games, which I've been playing my whole life, and it's really nice to play those ones, and then also enjoy and, and relax with, with good red wine and maybe a couple of beers, and, and being with people, without that, I think it, it would be too hard. But I also don't like the idea that coaching would be just a grind. Yeah. I really enjoy doing this one and, and being with, with the players and, and seeing them to get better. And it should not be always so that, that everything is just, just a grind and going just always through hard places. No, we have to be able to enjoy also enjoy this one. Enjoy the process, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. And on that note, one, one quick question. It might not be quick. The answer might not be quick, but the question will be. Um, you mentioned as well that um, you're not a coach yet because you haven't got fired yet. Okay, and, and you will. Okay, I will. I will. Uh, <laughs> I know that one. Maybe even today. Maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not because of me. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the idea, when we did the study with the serial winners, one of the things that came through is that even though these coaches know that they're going to get fired at some point, whenever they go into a new job, they go in there thinking, I'm going to be here for the next 10 years. And you, the point you made about, it's not about just winning, you need to develop. Okay. Do you go into jobs thinking, I'm going to be here for the rest of my life? Or do you always have that, I know I'm going to get fired, so I'm going to protect myself and be really short-term oriented? Or First of all, I think it's, it's wrong to say that it's not about winning. I think it's all about winning, but winning happens through development. I think the winning is just an end result of that development thing. And, and uh, I think that's important also to say always. But... No, I don't go to a place to be 10 years there because I have also personal dreams and, and uh, I, I want to get better and I want to see different countries and, and challenge also myself as a coach in that one. But, but I think those, those um, projects, if you, if you want to think of, if we go to a project, I think you have to be able to go that project through also yeah. first. And then, for example, now in Lahti, we, we made a four-year deal in the beginning, okay? Very rarely that happens that you are four years there and, and I've been now two years and maybe a third one still to come. But, um, but I don't think that it's going to be so that I go there that I'm going to be 10 years here. But I don't think about that getting fired because somebody else makes that decision. I can't help that one. I, I, I believe in, in doing this thing what we at the moment do and we do it as long as, as somebody lets us to do it. Fantastic. That's a great answer. Okay. 
Guys, over to you. Any, uh, any questions from you? Oh, here we go. We got one right there. Uh, Marius, Hungarian Federation. Thank you, Tommy, uh, for the presentation. It was really inspiring. I have one question. How do you usually deal with the players which, despite uh, being offered the best environment where you cultivate as a coach their uh, feeling of autonomy and uh, competence and relatedness, do not respond well to the team's uh, expectations? Of course, like it, it, it's not a walk in the park with any player and always the plan is good, but <laughs> there's a lot of problems with, with many guys that they, they want to go the easy road. They want to go the road of being lazy. But again, it's a question of their, their path. And if, if the player has, in, when we are building up the trust, if he tells, for example, to me that I want to get into the NHL, that the dream is NHL. And, and if he says that, it's pretty easy then always to get into it that, hey, this work is not enough for your own dream. It's not my dream for him to get into the NHL. It's his dream. So I think it's always important to get, get the player actively involved in that goal-setting process and in, in that process because it's, it's his process. And, and uh, when he has said it to me that, hey, this is my, this is my goal, this is my dream, and if he's not working towards it, then I, I can tell him that, hey, you lied to me. You lied to my face. What's the deal? Should we be honest now or, or should we change what we do? Should we change this practice habit, what you have? Should we try to find another way? And of course, again, this does not mean that we leave the player alone, that we don't kick him in the ass or, or like we really try to push them also. But they have to be pushed when they want themselves to be pushed. We want them to say it also, to give the permission to coach, to give the permission, and you have to earn that permission first. But uh, then in some, some cases, then we come to an agreement that this thing does not work. We have to go somewhere else then, and especially in, in hockey also, it's, it's a very short time period what we have. We talk about eight months or nine months of one season. So it's, it's very rare that you have five or six years. With, with a professional player at least. So we have to find that, that trust pretty quickly and to find those steps that how, how can we take those steps there. But um, it's usually just an honest discussion that at the moment you have set first your own goal and I want to help you to, to get there. And if the work towards it is not done, either we have been lying or then we have to change how we work. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Any any other questions? Yep, right here, please. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question. Uh, since you were a goalie and you were a coach now, uh, I know you have a goalie coach, but I want to know how you manage your goalie as well. Do you interfere or you let uh, your goalie staff doing the whole work? Because me. I don't have any goalie coach, so if you have any advice also how to manage the goalies. I have no idea about the goalies game anymore. <laughs> no, no uh, I have a, like in our staff, the perfect guy, like really good goalie coach. Actually, almost in every uh, team I have been, the goalie coaches have been very professional and they are very good. So they do their job with the goalies. We don't touch that one in, in any ways. Of course, playing time, the ultimate responsibility lies, lies on the head coach usually. But for us, the goalie coach makes the decision or at, he tells that he thinks that we should play like this with the goalies and we have gone with that one. So he does his work with the goalies. It has been a long time since I played. <laughs> Well, not that long, but, but still, and, and I have not gotten into, into that goalies game anymore so much, so I let them to do their work. I still know how to, how to do a skate safe, but you don't do those ones anymore, so. <laughs> Sides. Mental you know, side, yeah. 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 
of course, like for the goalies game, of course, the mental side is a, is a big thing, and you have to find ways how to how to improve um, your your uh, self confidence and how to get over mistakes and those those kind of things. But that process goes with the players the same way. We of course we want to help them to to get better on the mental side also. We use usually feeling of responsibility, self confidence. Those two are pretty much the biggest ones. We want them to start thinking of and start talking about and of course in self confidence usually you need you need good moments to build your self confidence and uh, we have to find those good moments in the game from somewhere else than just goals or passes you have to find inside the game stuff what you believe that I did this one well and with the goalies I know uh, at the moment our goalie coach usually talks about about um, what what their thinking process during the game was? What did he read the situation correctly? If he if he makes a mistake and he lets the puck in, then usually the head coach always looks at the goalie coach. Said, "What the fuck?" But but uh, <laughs> we try to usually these days only to look into the center eyes because the goalie's first look is towards the bench, always after a goal, especially with younger goalies. But maybe maybe not the more experienced ones. But you can see actually also on the highest levels they, we are humans. We're humans, and but usually those two two things are feeling of responsibility and self confidence. What we try to help them to uh, at least talk about. Great, thank you. Any? There we go. Question here, please. Thank you for the presentation. So I saw that you are also having meetings about life. Uh, some players may be a bit hesitant to share some personal things going in their life. Uh, I'm working with young girls, so I face it quite common. Did you ever face such kind of situation and how do you overcome it? And what's the con context of these meetings about their lives? Usually, of course, when, when we start the process, when we meet the first time, it's handshake and hi, I'm Tommy and then you are you. And, and then I tell about my family and, and my family background, what I do. And then he tells what his family background is, what he does and what, what schools he went to. And then it's a normal process you know, of starting to get somebody, uh, to know somebody. And then uh, the first time when we talk, it's usually an hour or one hour and 15 minutes. It's just chit chat. And of course... When they start to trust you, it's not the first time. It takes time. It takes a couple of months that they see that, hey, that guy really actually means what he's saying. and That it's not just bullshit talk, but what we also do sometimes. People, we, we don't treat us like we should together. But the, the start is just normal. Hi, I'm this one. Who are you and what do you do? And, and, and from there we build it into the game also, that what, what happens in the game and and then how, how we want to develop inside the game. Because still, the reason why they are there is that their, their personality is, is an athlete, they are hockey players, they want to get better in that one, that's their passion in life. So, so uh, But we have to first build it from the person to a hockey player, also in that, that uh, life discussion. But it has been, been mind-blowing what happens at the moment, and I think it's not a good thing that many... Players who are born in the 80s, my age group actually, we, we have also mental issues at the moment, which let's say 10 years ago, we, nobody was, was talking about those ones. You always have to be quiet and just go through that stone. And now, now they have started to talk about that one. And, and we had, for example, now during these two past years, we had two two cases where it was really interesting when the player comes and sits there and starts crying and says that his mind is black. And and those are those are those kind of moments where you as a coach, even though we think that we are doctors, we think that we are medical doctors also, that we know when you when a player can play or not. But in that in those cases it's just to be there and support and, and find a way to, to to get help from outside. But when they trust you that much then it's a pretty good feeling also as a coach. Great. Yeah, we, we are doctors, psychiatrists. Yes, everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. Everything. Relationship counselors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, any, any other questions? Right, I've got one, Tommy, a very selfish question, okay? Um, I work at a university, spend most of my time at the university. We are the world champions of having meetings, okay? <laughs> we have meetings where we decide when we're going to have the next meeting, okay? 
uh, and I wrote down um, you had 1,786 meetings in one season. It's no wonder you need the red wine. Okay? <laughs> I did, it's not just me. It's our staff. Yeah. Yeah. The question is really, with that amount of meetings, how do you make sure that those meetings are meaningful and that they don't become just things that you do? Of course, like with meeting, I mean, mean uh, that you meet the person. It's not that we go to a meeting room and we sit there, but, but uh, they are meaningful every time because it's, it's their thing that we're going through. It's, it's their dream what we're going through. So usually they are very motivated for those ones. And of course now these 1,786 uh, meetings of persons is for five no, six coaches, so you have to divide it there still to six. Still a pretty high it's, number. It's eh? high, <laughs> but it's also like, let's say, after a game, we have all our assi assistant coaches, have. they know that they have now four players that they're going to go through individual feedback about the game. So after practice, they take these four guys, okay, with you, I'm now, and then comes the other guy, and then that one, and, and that's already 12, 12 meetings there, like, for, for that one game and the same player does not get it every time. He has maybe said he doesn't want that much and somebody wants more and somebody wants less. And, but it happens just there during that daily routine that we have a lot, lot of talks. Yeah. And I think that's also the way how you build trust. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I hope you all agree with me. It's been a mind-blowing presentation. Absolutely fantastic. And can we please thank Tommy for, for, for sharing his time with us. <laughs> thank you. And enjoy the seminar. It's great to see you here. And, and again, enjoy coaching. It's the best profession in the world. Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Thanks.